Welcome to All About Your Benjamins, the podcast. This is the More Than Money series. As you can see, if you're watching this over on YouTube, I'm excited to introduce you to my very good friend, Kevin Mahoney. Kevin is the author of Living Your Own Financial Life. It, that chapter begins on page 193 if you're following along at home. Let's take a look at Kevin's bio so I can get you to the episode and conversation with him. So Kevin is a CFP professional and is the founder and CEO of Illumint, which is an award-winning Washington, D.C.-based company that specializes in financial planning for millennials. Kevin focuses in particular on empowering millennial parents to invest in their family's future. His non-judgmental, empathetic financial planning process helps his peers save for college, repay student loans, buy a home, and learn to invest. Business Insider recently named Kevin as one of the best financial advisors for millennials in the U.S. and his two young boys recently named him Best Father in the World, which is the best award he could have won out of everything, even more so than being in this book. All right. I'm excited to let you hear from Kevin. He's a great friend of mine. I hope you enjoy the conversation. If you've not bought the book, what are you waiting for? Go get a copy today and we'll see you all in this episode. All right, Kevin, I think it's important that since we are longtime friends, we stay focused and don't go over the 20 to 25 minutes that we have allotted for these episodes. So we're going to get right to it. Um, Deal. And I've, I've asked everybody this to kick it off. How many years have you been a financial advisor? I founded my firm in 2017. So this year is six. Um, okay. But I have had a, a finance background well before that, too. And and the reason I ask that is, you know, over the course of six years, that's, you know, numbers of clients, numbers of experiences that you could have written about. Yeah. You know, the one that you chose for the book, um, the chapter is called Living Your Own Financial Life. And if you're following along at home, it's on page 193. Um, if you haven't got your More Than Money book yet, you should. But what was it about this particular story uh, from your clients that made you want to choose this one? Yeah, so we all carry these experiences that we have with money throughout our lives, particularly the experiences we have when we're younger and, you know, we're learning from our parents and, and other adults. But there's probably a point later in life, let's say around retirement age, where you've had enough experiences on your own as an adult that maybe those, you know, kind of dominate how you, you think about money and how you make decisions. But for the clients I work with, all millennial couples, you know, around 40 or, or younger, I think the the childhood experiences still tend to, to linger and dominate a little more, especially if people haven't had conversations about them or haven't had to really um, reckon or deal with um, any particularly negative experiences that they had when they were younger. So I wanted to focus on a situation in which the experiences that people did have with money growing up were still influencing how they made decisions as very independent adults earning their own incomes and, and choosing how to save and invest. Um, and, and I think through conversations about what those experiences were and, and how they impacted them, it can change how people think about money and then change and hopefully empower them to make different decisions going forward. It's amazing how much our experiences as children shape who we are, and sometimes we don't even realize it. Like even yeah. beyond money, just as I've done some you know personal growth over the last year and reading and you know figuring out who I am and all that stuff, you realize that so many people's traumas and the way they feel about themselves can go all the way back to something that happened in their childhood. So mm -hmm. um, of course that falls its, its way into money. We have these money scripts that we didn't write ourselves that we got from from our family a lot of the time. Um, yeah, exactly. With without really like giving away too much of the chapter, what what's the main message? So we know it's going to be dealing around money stories and how we view money and why. But what's the what's the message you're hoping readers and listeners get from your chapter? I would love for people to feel empowered to make financial decisions that support the lives that they specifically want to live especially in those cases where those decisions may differ from decisions that their parents made or decisions that they feel like they should make based on things that they read about or things that, you know, just people commonly talk about in, in our country. Um, 
and by understanding, you know, what those background experiences were um, that really inform how they think right now, hopefully if they want, they can make that transition to something else and have those financial decisions really support um, where they are now and, and where they want to go in their life. So as a practitioner, you, know, you do this with your clients. Um, obviously, we can't get into great detail for every listener um, of this podcast, but kind of how how do you start to sort through these scripts that we have and uncover, you know, maybe this script isn't something that really aligns with what I truly believe. I'm, I'm, I'm carrying out this story that was imprinted on me, but it doesn't align with who I really am today. Like, how do you help people work through that and figure it out? Perhaps most commonly, people might notice it when they can see on paper or they can read something that, you know, they have the financial means or the financial opportunity to make a certain decision. But there's something in the back of their minds that's kind of making them feel stressed or preventing them from actually taking that step and, and following through on that decision. And it's often that little nagging thought that signals that there's something else going on that maybe you haven't really thought about before or you haven't addressed or it's some story from long ago that you you know totally forgot about, but it's still managing to influence how, how you think about money and think about these decisions. So that's typically a place where I would start. And, and oftentimes when clients are explaining to me, you know, why they reached out or why they're having certain doubts or um, they're hesitating to make certain decisions. Pretty quickly, we can see some of those, um, you know, signals or red flags kind of pop up and then we can try to work through what they may be and how, you know, they may act differently once they understand that. This will be probably the thousandth time I say this over the course of these episodes. But again, going back to, you know, why we titled the book More Than Money, you know, I think that a lot of people think finance, it's numbers and spreadsheets and investments mm -hmm. in the stock yeah. market. But the reality of it is the majority of what we do as advisors, those of us that are doing planning, it's it's the emotional side. It's, it's not just the numbers. And that yeah. when you – well, we'll see if you agree. I think that once you're able to help our – once we're able to help our clients sort through – the money scripts and understand, you know, why they view money the way they do, or help them figure out what they really value. That a lot of times the money problems, once you get to a certain point, you're able to cover all the, the expenses and the lifestyle. Like when you get to a certain point where you're not um, struggling to get by, the money problems kind of sort themselves out. That I have found a lot of times the struggle with money, whether it be overspending, the inability to save, making bad decisions it all ties back to these stories and this confusion that they have. But once people have aligned their values and once they understand them, the money stuff just kind of works itself out, which is hard to tell somebody because the money is such a stressful thing and it seems yeah. like it's out of our control to just say, hey, once you sort through all these things and really know what matters the most to you, money will kind of take care of itself. Um, but I've found that a lot of times it does. And not only that, but ironically, that's often – not why people reach out to a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. They may reach out to try to, you know, figure out whether they should do a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately is, is probably not the most meaningful question to address or the most meaningful decision to make. That's, that's kind of like a, a secondary consideration once you've figured out, you know, how you want to use your money and why, then we can address those more tactical things. Mm -hmm. um, people who, who reach out to an advisor often start with that type of, of question. Yeah, you take them down this path. Of, okay, you want to know Roth or not Roth IRA? Well, like, what do you want your money to do? And you, mm -hmm. you, we find out they want to do all of these things pre-retirement. It's like, well, okay, maybe Roth IRA, but you might want to put it somewhere else because now it's more accessible. You can do different things with it. So then you move totally away from the reason they thought they were coming in yeah. because you took the time to ask the questions and listen and help them sort through, which then allows you as an advisor to do a better job creating this game plan for moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I love it. That's speaking my language, but also <laughs> it's going to be like, it's going to be a common theme throughout all of these because it's all executed differently from advisors, but it is, it's the thread of it's not just about the money. It's, it's more the money. There's bigger things to it, which leads me to that's not the perception of what a financial advisor is going to do. Most people, I think when they think about sitting down with a financial advisor, it's going to be in a stuffy 
office, suits, talking numbers, invest in this, product comes across. That's the perception, I think. What is a misconception about financial advisors that you hope, either through your story or this opportunity on this, on this show, what's a misconception you'd like to clear up um, for those who may think financial advisors are a certain way? I'm glad we're wearing sweatshirts and, and hats and mm-hmm. other things so we can clear up that, that one misconception right off the bat. Um, I, I think it's related to, to something you touched on a minute ago, and that is I wish people would think of financial advisors more as someone that they can have conversations about money with in a way that is so uncommon in in the U.S. and in our culture. We're, you know, we're so limited for most people in who we feel like we can turn to to express, you know, concerns or worries or uh, uncertainties about what our financial future may hold, that even if you're interested in the tactical element of a Roth IRA versus a traditional IRA, what else can a financial advisor offer you if you felt like someone was just there to listen to all those anxieties and questions you've had about money that you're probably not having with very many people, if if anyone at all? Um, and from the advisor perspective, it's exactly those types of questions like we were just talking about that can really allow us to do our jobs as well as, as possible and help people structure their financial lives in a way that ultimately make their lives better. You brought up something that I want to spend a little bit more time on, um, you know, conversations around money. Money, for the most part in our society, is taboo. You don't talk about it, um, especially with strangers or even friends, but even within your family. How have you helped your clients begin to introduce conversations about money, you know, amongst spouses, with their kids, and encouraging this dialogue of money so it it does become easier to talk about, not just with you, but with each other, which ultimately helps kind of them steer their life and everybody be on the same page? Yeah, I'd like to think that I can serve as a little bit of a role model in that sense where, you know, if I'm being very open and non judgmental and I'm asking them questions about, their money that no one has ever asked them before. Hopefully it's, you know, a bit of an educational experience for them too, where they can see how different that is and how nice it feels and, and how much they benefit from being able to think about some of those things or have someone ask them some of those questions. But then they can turn around and, and do similar things with their partner or with their kids or, or with good friends. Um, I, I don't know how often that actually happens. I think I think it, it needs to unfold gradually over time, just based on how our, our culture is um, structured, mm-hmm. like we were talking about. But I, I'd like to think that the way I try to handle it is um, it allows them to see something that they can do differently with, with people in their lives, too. Sounds good. All right. We're going to get personal. I think that it's good for you. You talk about being open and, and transparent with your clients and providing that that space. I think it's good for us advisors who are supposed to be the money people to share, you know, some of our experiences with money, good and bad. So, yeah. my first question to you is: What's the best um, personal finance decision you've made? For me, it was leaving a more traditional corporate job to start Mm -hmm. my own company because it allowed me to take control of my time. And even though your question was about a financial decision, that ability to control my time has, has significant financial consequences, both for, for the the good and, and the bad, but it's it's really that starting point in in allowing me to try to live the life I want to live, whether it's spending more time with my kids or taking better care of my health, whatever whatever it might be. Um, and it's it's not easy. That, that type of decision isn't easy, and it wasn't easy. It put a, a lot of burden on my wife. Um, you know, when I I gave up that corporate income, but that decision was kind of the ultimate building block or starting point. Um, for really taking control of not only my time, but the the financial life that I would live after that decision. 
Well, and it's you being a uh, you know an example for your clients. You can look yeah. back and say, hey, like we went through our personal plan and we talked about our values of what was most important, and we valued our time more important than a salary or maybe the security, the perceived security of a corporate job. Yeah. And we repositioned our financial plan, and our finances to make it happen. And we did these things. And like, so it's like to tell somebody to do that when you, when if it is a clear that you're not doing it yourself becomes a little bit harder for clients to implement. But if you can say, Hey, from experience, I know what you're going to go through. I know what you're going to feel. And, and like, it's normal because I went through it as well. Like that carries a lot of weight. Um, I want to stay in this thread for a second though, and go back to leaving the corporate job. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people who want to do something similar. Maybe it's not going to start their own business, but go into another career or, but they feel this, that they're going to be giving up this security of this corporate job, the security of the insurance. And that security keeps them somewhere that's not right for them. Mm -hmm. And I, I get the sentiment of that security, but I also think that in our situation, going out on our own, building our own business, I view my career choice put me in a more secure space, even though there was some uncertainty around income early on, because now I'm in a position where I'm, I'm not going to get laid off. Yeah. I'm not going to get um, my pay cut or my commissions changed because a company needs to hit quarterly earnings reports. And like there is security in the corporate world, but I also think that it's a false sense of security because that can be taken away from you solely because of a spreadsheet decision where if you're if part of your goal and what you want to do is do your own business, yes, there's some risks associated with it, but once you get it going, then it's all on you. And I think most people, if allowed to, would rather better themselves than anybody else. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts around that, but I just... I want to encourage more people to evaluate the security that they feel like they have and see, is it really as secure as they thought? And is it keeping them from following the thing they're really supposed to be doing? Personally, I, I totally agree with you. I would love, you know, for every client I have, or even every friend I talk to who's very frustrated at work, I would love to encourage a, a similar path, but I, I, I don't want to diminish um, how hard it is to make that choice and how real the risks are and, you know, how many challenges can come up, especially if you have young kids or, you know, if your spouse or, or partner is not a high earner, there's, there's just a lot there. But the, the thing I would focus on is we, we focus so much of our time, we focus so much of our energy and attention on building financial wealth, but we often neglect, um, being time wealthy, you know, having, having this ability to, to really live our lives as we want to live them in the near term and not wait until we're 60 or 65 to, you know, have the, the typical day that we really want to have or to, you know, take the trips or, or do the activities that are most important to us. And, and I think we, a lot of us can use more of a balance there where, you know, what level depending on the, the lifestyle you want to live, like what level of income is worth the trade-off to gain more time. Mm -hmm. But we're often so focused on just the financial piece that I think we neglect the benefits, the, the really significant benefits that a lot of us could gain from having more time, even if it meant a little less money. I want to throw out a quick disclaimer before we go to the next question, but you know, I, I have to be careful sometimes of putting like my passion for s certain ways of doing things out yeah. there. I don't live in a world of absolutes. So just because I think people should consider taking more control over their career and doing what really excites them, that, that's not always the right answer for everybody. And it's not always possible either. So right. I, don't, I don't share that example as a shame on like working in a corporate world. My thing is, I just want people to really take the time to have the conversations with, with you or with their financial advisor about what they really want. So then they can evaluate it and, and know. I think so many people never even take that step because they feel so safe in their job, they don't want to explore it. But maybe if they were to explore it, they realize, hey, that, that leap's not as scary as it once was. And now that security that I feel is not as valuable as I once thought it was because I took the time to just explore it. So there's no right answer for anybody to live their life. I don't suggest that. And I just want to make sure that I don't come across that way because I don't, I don't want to be the person that, that gets painted in that, in that way. <laughs> but I do agree um, with you. I think there are probably pieces of that or, or elements of that whole decision and that whole process that can apply to, 
to anyone, no matter what mm-hmm. job or industry they're in. Yeah. All right. So transparency time. This is the question you didn't know was coming. So we heard your best financial decision, which I I appreciated. It doesn't always have to be like a dollar th- a dollar thing or an investment thing. And to this date, none of them have been investment related, which is not a surprise given more than money. But um, on the flip side, I've yet to figure out the right way to to ask this question. But what is the what is the the you know, the decision you made financially that you learned the biggest lesson from because it didn't work out the way you thought it would, which is a long-winded way of asking what's your worst financial decision, but I feel like that brings shame, money shame to the conversation, <laughs> and I don't want it to be that way. So I want it to be like, what's the, what's the financial decision that taught you the best lesson because it didn't work out the way you would want it to? So I, I'm going to give an example that doesn't directly answer your question, but it's the best that I can think of without taking five five minutes of our time here. Um, when I was young, not too too far out of college, I had some some debt, and it was it was kind of hanging over my head. the The interest rate wasn't punishing, but I didn't like having the debt. And I had saved some money while I was working in college and, and earned you know, right after college um, that could have been put to a lot of different purposes. And in hindsight, I think I would have benefited significantly more if I had actually used that savings for different purposes, like specifically investing for the long term. But kind of on a whim, one night when I was tired and frustrated about things, I just decided to to pay off the debt. This is this is definitely not directly answering your question, and it's kind of one of those um, responses you give in an interview when they ask you for like some negative characteristic about yourself, mm-hmm. and what you actually tell is not all that bad. Um, it certainly wasn't the worst thing in the world to get rid of debt, but I compared to where I am now and the decisions I make now. I was much more like rash and emotional and, you know, didn't ask for other people's opinions. There were just a lot of parts of that decision-making process that were not great and could have been much better. And and I think would have led to a different outcome. Um, But I was young and I didn't know as much as I I do now. And I made that choice and I, I had to live with it for better or worse. I think it's a perfect answer. Like it, it doesn't have to be something like you're embarrassed about. And I think there's so many layers to that example. And I'll hit on real quick, but because I don't want to take too long. But like, first off, just the whole conversation of money's personal. Like that makes you think of when Morgan Housel came last year, or maybe it was two years ago now, to the community. Yeah. And he said that his his best financial decision was his worst money decision. It was paying off his house. Right. I know what my money could have compounded to, but the value of the peace of mind was worth more than the dollars. And a lot of financial advisors are going to say, go with the spreadsheet and downplay how much that peace of mind works. So yours was less about peace of mind, but that it just illustrates that yeah. sometimes the, the wrong money decision is actually the right decision for other reasons. And I'm glad um, you brought that example up as a comparison, because I, I, I think it's important to point out the key difference in that. Someone like Morgan, with that decision he made about his mortgage, was very intentional and very thoughtful about it. And mm-hmm. I think... I imagine did plenty of research, like knew what the options were, knew the trade-offs. That was not what I did right. when I made my decision. Um, you know, like I said, it was more emotional. It was more just doing something that would make me feel better in the moment. Um, and I, I think that difference is important because you can you can make a decision that is contrary to what other people might do or contrary to the most common rule of thumb or advice. But that doesn't mean it's it's wrong for you particularly if you were thoughtful um, and intentional about it. That was not the case mm-hmm. for me. Well, that's the other reason I'm glad you shared that is because you know it does highlight money is emotional and sometimes we make emotional decisions where having somebody to bounce ideas off of or get advice from can save us from that. And then yeah. the final thing is sometimes bad money decisions really do cause a big problem. But sometimes bad money decisions aren't really as bad as we think they are. So you're probably going to end up with a little bit less in your accounts when you die. Right. But it's not a decision that you have to beat yourself up over your lifetime because you made a stupid decision when you're young that was emotional and now you can't retire or do these different things. Like yeah. There are major, major money mess-ups, 
But I think those are few and far between. Most of them, most of the shame that's out there and the beating up of ourselves are over decisions that will just be decimal points in the grand scheme of life. And it yeah. keeps us from moving forward and keeps us bogged down by these money stores. So I think that was the perfect um, good, bad decision that, that you could explain and, and do the, the interview answer. Good. All right. So I know that being a part of this project takes a lot of time. You value your time writing the chapter, revising it, being a part of the group to do it, promoting it, coming on this podcast. Um, why did you decide to, to, to donate some of your time to the cause? And I say donate again because reminding everybody, or if this is your first time listening to one of these episodes, all of the proceeds from More Than Money on the AGC side of things and the author side of things are being donated to organizations within the financial planning community to help move our profession forward. So right now it's BLX and the Foundation for Financial Planning. So it truly is a donation of time and energy. Why'd you do it? For the things that we've talked about today and for a lot of the messages that are in the book, it's hard it's hard for us to appreciate, but you know, outside of our circles, these types of messages just aren't delivered that often to the general public. Um, mm. There aren't enough people in well-qualified pro- professional positions relaying some of these approaches to thinking about money. So from my perspective, every opportunity that we have to use a new medium, whether it's it's social media or you know, write in, in book form or write in blog form, every opportunity is a chance to reach people who otherwise might not hear these types of messages. And, and we're all limited on an individual level as to, you know, how much time we can commit to one or how many different channels we can use. But um, this effort is a good example of how, you know, as a group, we can come together to, you know, create a relatively big project compared to a, a tweet or a single blog post to hopefully reach more people with the types of things that we think are important to consider. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you participated in it. As I've told everybody, and I genuinely mean this, so if people listen to all of the episodes, they're probably like, this is part of my script. It's not. Like, <laughs> I believe that things finish in the way they're supposed to and that this, bur- this book is the perfect version of this book it's supposed to be because everybody contributed their chapter. Like This book would not be as good as it is without your chapter. They all fit together. So I'm glad that you participated because the book wouldn't be as good if it wasn't for your contribution. So thank you for contributing. And also thank you for being the advisor that you are. Um, Again, I I I know everybody in the community, but I know you really well, given our our, our friendship and going back in time. And I know that you are a great steward of the profession. I am getting old. I am getting old. (laughs) Uh, um, So I just want to thank you also for being a good representation of what our profession is moving towards and giving people hope that they can find a good financial advisor to work with who's actually going to help them um, and not just kind of put them in investments and let them go. So I appreciate you doing that as well. I have good role models, Justin Costelli. No, oh, well, <laughs> thank you. Um, saying thank you is a hard thing to say sometimes. So thank you. Um, all right, man. Well, hey, I know you are a busy man. Time is important to you and you've got some boys to go pick up. So I'm going to thank you for being on the show Remind everybody to go get a copy of More Than Money. And um, do me a favor. If you wouldn't mind watching this on YouTube, go to the comments. If you're listening on the podcast, go to the comments there. And let Kevin know what your favorite part of his chapter was, what your favorite part of this episode was. And just give him some feedback because as a content creator, you know, we, you put stuff out there and you don't always get feedback back. Um, so it's nice to know that your words, whether they're written or spoken, meant something to somebody and, and moved them. So let him know what his chapter meant for you, what this podcast episode meant for you, just so he gets some feedback and he can know that his work is, is impacting people. Um, so with that, I'll let everybody get going. Thank you for tuning in. I still haven't got the perfect ending line, but just remember everything about personal finance is more personal finance and it's more than money. It's not just the dollars. It's not just the investments. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks, Justin. <laughs>